Doom 2 is a safe sequel that doesn't break up the Doom formula very much, but at the same time, it is also ambitious with its more novel set pieces, larger map designs and higher enemy counts. The shooting mechanics of Doom 2 are exactly the same as its predecessor, with the only additions being the super shotgun and a handful of new enemies. Each new demon that was introduced in Doom 2 has altered the series radically, and I couldn't see a world without the Revenant or Archvile in a Doom game. That all being said, Doom 2 doesn't fix what isn't broken, but the level design has been a constant point of criticism for many many people, including myself unfortunately. To be fair, Doom 2 was developed in only 10 months, and most of the maps were designed by one person, Sandy Peterson. I talked about him before in my last video, and he was responsible for creating 17 out of the 32 levels for the game. He was the workhorse for Doom 1 and Doom 2, and either way you slice it, he worked hard on his maps and he really grafted to impress in software. I would even go so far as to say that Sandy Peterson was the MVP of Doom 2. Many fans respect mappers like John Romero, American McGee, the Casale brothers, and for good reason, they have designed brilliant levels over the years, but Sandy Peterson should also get the same respect, even though I may not be in love with his Doom 2 levels. If Romero is considered an artist and praised for his elaborate and amazing looking maps, then Peterson would be the innovator of Doom level design and known for his experimental style. Peterson's work on Doom 2 may not be my cup of tea, but every single one of his maps brought something new to the table and were very inventive. He has even admitted that his levels weren't as pretty as Romero's or American McGee's maps, but he still ushered in new ways to play the game with his map layouts, and we'll talk about that more later on. Even though I can do without some of Peterson's contributions to Doom 2, that doesn't mean he hasn't made any maps I enjoy. Case in point, Mount Erebus might be my favourite Doom level ever made. And to get this out of the way, of course I'm not blaming Peterson at all, and if he had more time, I'm sure his maps would be much more polished. I couldn't even imagine what it must have been like working at id Software if I was him, trying to crank out 17 maps for one of the most anticipated video game sequels ever created. I respect him a lot as a mapper for his efforts on Doom 2, and either way you think about the final product, the game sold like crazy, and one of the reasons why was that you could actually buy it from a store. id Software and publisher GT Interactive binned the shareware model as as Doom 2 was now a fully commercial game. Instead of the episodic structure that Doom 1 followed, Doom 2 makes you play all 32 maps without any breaks in between, which I think hinders the overall experience. Doom 2 would have been better off retaining the episode formats, as the pacing would have been much better. A common complaint that I hear about Doom 2 is the lack of consistency with each map since they all look and feel so different from one another. I personally believe that this criticism is a bit overblown, since Doom 1 also had rather abstract level design, but in any case, an okay fix for this would have been the return of the episodic structure. So, I'm obviously going to take a look back at Doom 2 today, and it's interesting that the game's level design has been described as being both brilliant and poor. To me, Doom 2 innovated so much and introduced many unique types of maps, but with any first attempt, there are issues. These are my problems with Doom 2. We're going to have ourselves a little marathon here, with me examining each of Doom 2's maps. Think of this video kinda as a pro Doom episode by Civ 11, but instead of Civ's wits and great sense of humour, you replace it with some Australian twats. Anyway, let's start with level 1, which is typically a good place to begin. The first map in Doom 2 is Entryway and it's one of the most iconic maps in the franchise. Out of the four original Doom IWADs, Doom 2 has the second best opening map, 
with Hanger beating it out for obvious reasons. If you look back and walk through this little corridor, you are able to grab the chainsaw, which I think is an amazing piece of level design. Right off the bat, this level teaches the player that thinking outside of the box and exploring the less obvious path will be rewarded in Doom 2 with the hidden chainsaw. Also, I just think that the chainsaw makes this level way more fun to go through. Beyond that, Entryway is a pretty perfect starting map, and as the title implies, it's a fantastic entry into Doom 2. When you walk back at the start of the level, you can see a glimpse of the outside area. Then, using one of the secrets, the player is able to go outside onto the grassy field and obtain the shotgun. I love when Doom maps show you a peek of the outside early on, and that encourages me at least to explore and find a way to access there. E1M1 of the original Doom does this as well using the blue armor in the toxic waste, and I think it's great. That being said, Entryway is very well designed, and it's one of Sandy Peterson's best Doom 2 levels. Underhauls is the map that everyone remembers from Doom 2 for one specific reason, that being the Super Shotgun reveal. Apart from this level housing one of the best guns in video game history, Map 2 is another brilliant level in my opinion. While Entryway featured rather open rooms and projectile based demons to take care of, Underhauls is like the inverse of that design. Long, cramped spaces and hitscan enemies are what Map 2 could comprises of. Sure, there are quite a few imps and pinky demons in this level, but you'll end up fighting groups of shotgunners in dark hallways most of the time. I mean, the map is even called Underhauls for fuck's sake. They do throw a hefty amount of enemies your way for a second level, but that is directly countered by the inclusion of a super shotgun. Another solid map and this time it was designed by American McGee. A little spoiler before we move on, I generally like all of Doom 2's maps until about when we get up to Tricks and Traps. Map 8 is when the game starts to kinda turn to shit for me. The third map of Doom 2 is pretty damn good, but it's just not as iconic as Entryway or Underhauls. With map 1, well every map 1 in a Doom game has to be solid, and as for map 2, they introduce the Super Shotgun. The Gauntlet, or Gantlet, includes the infamous Chain Gunner, or Heavy Weapons Dude, and he is the first new enemy in Doom 2. Even though this game is one of my least favourites in the series, I must say that the enemies introduced in Doom radically altered the Doom franchise for the rest of time. The Art Trial, the Hell Knight, the Chain Gunners, The Revenant, even The Pain Elemental. All of these were not just throwaway demons that were made up at the last minute, and you can tell that they really tried to make each new monster fit into Doom 2 naturally. As for the map itself, I believe it is well designed, but I don't really have a lot to say about it. The Gantlet is just good, and offers up some good gameplay. In the section where the player first encounters the Chain Gunner, the map presents a couple of options on how to approach the hitscan enemies ahead. You can either snipe them from afar as they come into your line of sight, or you can just go in this middle room, guns blazing, and hope for the best. I mean, this map gives you the chain gun and some ammo when you kill the heavy weapons dudes, so it's kind of encouraging you to let loose in that middle room. But yeah, map 3 is a good time. The Focus is up next, and I enjoy this one to a certain extent. This is only my preference, but I believe that the three previous maps were more fun. Now don't get me wrong, Map 4 is still a solid level, but I do notice my enjoyment decreasing compared to Entryway, Underhauls, and the Gantlets. However, there are some cool traits about this map, like how this window goes up and down so you have to time your attacks effectively. Hit scanners are on the other side, so you have to account for their attacks and try not to get hammered with bullets. This window section lasts like a few seconds, but I'm a fan of it nevertheless. So map 5 is the first map in Doom 2 that I am not a fan of, and it's a shame because I really enjoy the next two coming up. 
I don't find the gameplay or level design that interesting in the waste tunnels. These lifts that immediately go down as you walk on them are more annoying than anything else, as you just get fucked up by the imps below. At least they have health to compensate, but my issue with them is not that they are unfair or difficult, it's just that they're not that fun in my opinion. The rest of the map is fine, I guess. The waste tunnels is a meh experience for me. The Crusher is a much more gimmicky map compared to the previous levels in Doom 2. As you can tell by the map name, there is a Crusher device that you can use to take out a spider mastermind, or a group of Hell Knights on the lower difficulty settings. While this is the first map in Doom 2 that uses a gimmick, the map doesn't rely on it whatsoever. The Crusher device used to kill the Spider Mastermind is awesome, but if you take the gimmick away, then nothing really is lost. Map 6 is still a solid map and can stand on its own two feet without the gimmick, which I find to be an important factor to keep in mind with any map. If you make custom levels for Doom, first of all, I must say that I don't have a degree in Doom map design or anything, so take this with a grain of salt. Anyway, if you make a map with a really interesting gimmick, just see when you take out the gimmick if it can stand on its own as a good map. As for the remainder of map 6, it has really fun gameplay, and it also introduces the Revenants, one of my favourite Doom enemies. In the first moments of the map, you are thrown into this dark room with several shotgunners, imps, and one lone Revenant. There are many pillars in the dark room, so you are able to block the Revenant's homing fireballs, but regardless, this is a tense little set piece, and it's the perfect way to introduce the Revenants. Map 7 is dead simple, literally and figuratively, and what can I actually say about this level that hasn't already been said? Almost every Doom 2 Megawad has ripped off dead simple for their map 7s, and it's such a fun map to go through. Tricks and Traps was designed by Sandy Peterson, and he is truly a pioneer of Doom map design. This level offers a collection of doors that contain a unique set of challenges with each one. And while I think Milo Casali's Heck from TNT Evolution executes this idea better, I cannot knock Peterson's creativity here. The room that everyone remembers from this level includes a lone cyber demon and a bunch of barons, and it taking advantage of Doom's infighting. The rest of the rooms are a little unremarkable, but again, back in 1995, Tricks and Traps was the first of its kind and should obviously be respected. At least the room with the narrow hallway and the barons teleporting from either side of you is terrific, and while it is such a simple idea, I think it works as it forces players to strafe in a very tight spot. As for the rest, the room with the horde of pinkies is a little bland, the room that has the caco demons appearing out of these demonic alcoves is pretty cool even though the design of the room itself is rather generic, the pain elemental room can be skipped altogether since it doesn't house any keys, and it should be skipped because it sucks, and then the room with the teleporting imps just uses the same idea as the teleporting baron room, but in larger numbers. How how does Tricks and Traps stack up today though? Well, it's fine for what it is, but it ultimately introduced a new Doom level type with each door housing a different challenge, and that's gotta count for something. I can't actually describe why I don't like this map. I just don't get a kick out of playing it. Don't get me wrong, there is a great part in this map with a bunch of demons surrounding this little building here, but that's everything that I find noteworthy in this level. Map 9 is pretty poor. I don't have much to say apart from that. Detailed map analysis, I know. I'm annoyed at myself that I don't like Map 10 because I generally find open areas with lots of demons to fight fun and refueling base has that. This level is an endurance for sure, and even though I can appreciate that element of it, Map 10 feels like a slog more than a fight for survival. If I rush for the exit, the map does not feel rewarding, but if I'm in it for the long haul and I'm scrounging for ammo to stay alive, it feels boring after a while. 
I know many people love this map for its high enemy counts coupled with the limited ammo, and I understand where you're coming from, but I just can't get into it. I don't think that the map itself is that well designed, and the gameplay can get stale and even frustrating at times, like when I'm dealing with constant pain elementals. Not the fun kind of frustrating either, at least to me. Our main man, John Romero, contributes his first level in Doom 2 with map 11, Circle of Death. It's a decent enough map, with another gimmick that does not get in the way of the gameplay or the core level design. We encounter the Archvile for the first time in this level, who is potentially the most dangerous new monster in Doom 2. Even though I have a ton of issues with this game, I do like how we gradually meet each new enemy. However, as the single player game goes on, Doom 2 naturally runs out of tricks. Speaking only about map 11 though, it's a fine inclusion and has some decent gameplay. The Archvile introduction is not as strong as the Revenant or Chain Gunner reveal, but as a standalone map, Circle of Death does just fine. Oh, and I like how this map is also known as O of Destruction, which is a nod to some nerdy Ultima weapon. Doom directly referencing pop culture and being self-aware is what the franchise is built upon, so it's always fun to see these little homages. The Factory is a weird map, since there are set pieces that I enjoy, but they don't link up to the rest of the level in any way and can be ignored. The large mob of imps in this rather small corridor is fun to deal with, but it is totally unnecessary to go through. The same thing goes with the building filled with shotgunners that you need to carefully climb up in order to get the items. This is awesome, and it most certainly gives you practice for map 29 with the tight staircase, but again, there is no need to go in there, and the rest of map 12 isn't really compelling in my opinion. Speaking of bad maps, let's get into the most infamous map of Doom 2 called Downtown. This level is special in some ways, as it is the first one in official Doom history to feature a cityscape or something trying to resemble a city. The concept of having a wrecked city to explore in Doom is incredible, but this ultimately falls flat in execution because Downtown is an absolute mess of a map. Thank God for Doom Eternal, as that was the first time in my opinion that the Hell on Earth idea had been fully realised. 20 years later, but still, id Software did a wonderful job with the game. Going back to map 13, my fundamental issue with it is the sheer lack of direction. It doesn't feel like a city, or even just a group of buildings with a clear purpose. The player doesn't feel rewarded for exploring, it honestly feels like a waste of time to, and it shouldn't because this is an open-ended city that should entice you to explore it. The map seems thrown together, and everything feels placed at random. If there needs to be a giant arrow on the grounds pointing to where the player needs to go, then that's typically a bad sign. I want to directly compare Downtown to a previous map from Doom 1, just to make my point further. Episode 3, Mission 6, also known as Mount Erebus, broke new ground in the original Doom game due to its open world design. By the way, both map 13 and E3 M6 were designed by Sandy Peterson, so this is a perfectly fair comparison. It's not like I'm pitting one of Sandy Peterson's maps next to another designer's, no, these are both of his works. One of the reasons why Mount Erebus works is because of its landmarks. I think if you want to construct any open world map in Doom, the most important thing to add is landmarks, so the player can get their bearings and know where they are on the map at any given point. I want to do a play by play of E3 M6 so you have a good idea of what I'm talking about. When we first load up the map, we see the door of a building in the dead centre of the screen. The building is uniquely textured, making it relatively easy to locate when playing. This, right here, is a good landmark, and gives the player indication of roughly where they are and where they are going to go. 
If we look left, we see an island full of items, and on the right, there is another building with fucking skulls on it. Everything so far is pretty distinct and can be easily recognised. The structure that we're looking at now houses a teleporter to the Blue Key. If we go inside, there's nothing except for monsters, but two areas can be opened up which are marked by the candles on the ground. Now I think having the blue key hidden like this can be a point of criticism, but at least the spot is visually signalled to the player. Additionally, the specific room where the blue key is housed has the same texture as the starting area, representing some importance. With all that mentioned, Mount Erebus has plenty of landmarks and points of interest to 1. Keep the player engaged with the open level design, and 2. Make sure that they aren't lost and wrapped up in some bullshit room that doesn't hold any cool items or secrets. Going back to downtown, most of these buildings either look the exact same, or are textured in a very similar way. American McGee is back with map 14 and it is definitely his weakest level in Doom 2 for me. I generally enjoy this map, but there's nothing here to write home about. The level mostly involves picking off faraway hitscan enemies that are across from you, and there's also another battle with the Arch Vial who doesn't pose that much of a threat. The Inmost Ends is great at being a competent Doom 2 map, but it is pretty generic in the long run, especially compared to American McGee's other levels in the game. I mean, this guy designed Dead Simple, The Crusher, Underhauls, and another map that's coming up that I think is better than this one. The key puzzle in map 14 is quite easy to solve, and the whole killing hitscan enemies from afar thing is fun to do during this level. Sandy Peterson had a crack at doing a city level with downtown, but now it's time to talk about John Romero's version of 1 with map 15. Yeah, I've really warmed up to Industrial Zone, and I find it to be one of the highlights of Doom 2. One improvement that map 15 has over downtown is that the rooftop snipers are handled way better. They are hit scanned this time around, so the player needs to take them out quickly, rather than the map just having a fuck ton of imps throw fireballs at you from half a fucking map away. Industrial Zone creates urgency, while Downtown was just pretty annoying. Along with the better enemy placements, Map 15 is more focused and there's a great amount of verticality in this level, with the player having to leap across to different buildings to progress. And both Romero and Peterson utilised the increased height to create unique set pieces. If you go through the secret exit in this level, you move on to maps 31 and 32, and I have a lot to say about them. So we have reached the secret levels of Doom 2, Wolfenstein and Gross. Instead of acting as rather standard secret levels, like Fear, Military Base and Fortress of Mystery, Doom 2's secret maps are more novel, as they are replicating two stages from Wolfenstein 3D. Map 31, Wolfenstein, is a remake of the first level in Wolfenstein 3D, while Map 32, Gross, is paying homage to Wolfenstein's first episode boss fights. Instead of Hans Gross, it just chucked in a cyber demon and called it a day. I love the idea of these secret levels, since they take something old and give it a different spin, similar to what Warrens did in the original Doom. I like that id connected not only Wolfenstein and Doom together, but they also threw in Commander Keen for good measure. However, Map 31 is just Wolfenstein 3D Map 1, which is fine and it's a cool homage, but if you've already played Wolfenstein, then you aren't missing out on much. At least there's this demonic secret spot with stuff inside. In Map 32, which they dubbed the super secret level, it's just a cyber demon fight, but with Nazi symbols on the wall. While I do appreciate that id is celebrating their old properties in this maps, which is a tradition that carries on in their current games, I can't rate these too highly. As I've said, Commander Keen can be located at the end of map 32, which him being included is great, but also annoying. Why couldn't these two secret maps have even more references to id software history? Maps 31 and 32 could have been this massive celebration of 
Love, Wolfenstein, Commander Keen, Catacombs 3D, even fucking Dangerous Dave. Maybe they couldn't because of their soft disc publishing agreements, but still, I feel like even if you put in more Commander Keen enemies and references, that would make these maps way more memorable. If Dangerous Dave, Catacombs, and other obscure id titles couldn't have made it in, they should have put in the fucking dope fish or something. Turn maps 31 and 32 into a hodgepodge of Commander Keen and Wolfenstein 3D. Maybe I'm overthinking these two secret levels, and to be honest they are still cool to see included, but more could have been done. I mentioned that the only sorta gimmicky secret map from the original game was Warren's. That level was a remix of Episode 3, Mission 1, and it's honestly my favourite secret level in that game. The other ones are very standard maps, that's not a knock on them or anything, but it's just strange to even see them as secret levels. Military base is very good. Fortress of Mystery is fucking boring and hardly worth unlocking, and Fear is just alright. I'm interested in what led them to make secret levels in the original Doom to begin with, as they acted like regular maps for the most part. We have another city level with map 16, and it's not great, but at least it's not as bad as downtown. I don't usually critique the look of a map, but Suburbs is pretty unappealing. We have this bland floor texture, along with the basic shaped buildings that don't really age well, but that won't take you out of the experience too much in my opinion. Apart from that, Suburbs is nothing special, and it's one of the less memorable Doom 2 maps. I know that some people love this one, but it doesn't do too much for me. It's disappointing as well, since the Hell on Earth idea is so compelling. If we look at map 29 from Plutonia, the map designers created this little town area and it actually looks like a town. There's walkways that actually go places, there are quite a few landmarks that the player can use to get their bearings, and the entire map is pleasant to look at. Map 16 hasn't aesthetically aged the best, but at least it's enjoyable to blast through. Map 17 is called Tenements, and I really enjoy this level. The rocky bridge that you have to travel across to grab the red key is probably my favourite bit of gameplay in the level. If you panic and try to avoid the coming attacks too haphazardly, you'll probably fall in the pits. Which is actually not a bad thing, since you can teleport to higher ground that way. You need to focus and plan out what you're gonna do while in that room, since the door immediately shuts and more monsters spawn in. Apart from the bridge section. I also like the part where you need to grab the blue key with revenants and hit scanners attacking you. There are lots of good gameplay moments in tenements and the map design is quite pleasant as well. This is another map I've grown a soft spot for. I used to not really find it that remarkable, but I've since replayed it and I've kind of learned to love it. Designed by Sandy Peterson again, Map 18, The Courtyard, isn't the most intricate level, but it doesn't have to be, and its simplicity is welcomed. I like the fact that this map lets down its defences and just says, here's some weapons, an open arena, and a massive group of demons to fight. Have fun. I mean that's demonstrated perfectly, with a yellow key hiding in plain sight. There's no real puzzles to solve, or any key hunts, nothing like that. Map 18's just saying, blow some demons up and end the level the same way you came. In a room full of Kevin Cloud's arm hair. Oh and the way that the courtyard looks is awesome, with all of the creepy faces around and the wood-grass texture combo. I know fans of the Citadel appreciate its magic castle quality, but I'm not a fan of it at all. I see what they're trying to go for, but it doesn't work for me. Whenever I come back to Doom 2 and get to this map, I just use the secret teleporters to bring me to each key so I can finish it as fast as possible. I have no idea why this map is called Gotcha, but this is another gimmicky level that's actually well designed. The gimmick this time around is that the Cyber Demon and the Cyber Mastermind fight on these two podiums. This is awesome, it's like seeing two titans go at it and when it's all over, you get to fuck up the winner. I usually see the Spider Mastermind win due to its hitscan chain gun, and when we carry on with the level, you can see that it's a well designed map. 
The gimmick does not interfere or clash with the actual map design, which is a huge plus for me. Gotcha is a very short map, but sometimes that can be a positive. Maps like the Inmost Ends or the Circle of Death work due to their rather short length. That being said, Map 20 has many little places to explore and there are plenty of things to find by just looking around the map. Overall, Gotcha is quality stuff. I know that this is like everyone's least favourite map in Doom 2, or at least it's up there. Map 21, Nirvana, has been called ugly, boring, and too short, and I can agree that it doesn't look that great at all. I will also mention that the blue key is basically worthless since its door is broken and you can just walk through it. But I generally enjoy Nirvana. The gameplay is mostly fun for me, when you have to pick off each set of demons on their separate platform. This map is objectively not great, but I actually like it for some weird reason. People have criticised Nirvana's length, saying that it's way too short, but I think of that as a positive. Sometimes I just enjoy maps that you can blow through in a few minutes. I also enjoy the beginning section with the shotgunners and revenants, as it can get rather frantic if you just let the enemies gang up on you. I know I'm in the minority, but Nirvana is enjoyable and I don't hate it whatsoever. Speaking of enjoyable maps, the Catacombs is up next, and it is both chaotic and fun. This level is American McGee's last contribution to Doom 2, and I believe he delivered with a solid final map. I initially had some trouble with this level, mainly due to the several chain gunners and the Revenant's homing projectiles fucking up my day. Then I rediscovered that using the normal teleporter, as opposed to the secret teleporter, makes this first section a lot less tough. Similar to the other American McGee maps, the Catacombs is pretty short, but very well designed at the same time. Once you memorise where each Chain Gunner and Revenant is placed so you can prioritise which ones to kill first, the rest of the map is not that challenging. Still though, Map 22 is a lot of fun. Barrels of Fun is one of the most polarising levels in Doom 2 and I don't hate it. The map is pretty experimental, and that's rather par for the course with Peterson. As the title suggests, there is a large group of barrels ready to explode at any moment, but it's not as frustrating as some people claim. I actually prefer getting rid of the barrels early on so they don't become an issue, since they can be your worst enemy in this map. I think the map's gameplay improves when you get to the Spider Mastermind, and it becomes basically like any other Doom 2 map. Barrels of Fun is okay, with the only frustrating part being the abundance of pain elementals and the lost souls that they can generate, but they're annoying in every map, so whatever. Regardless of whether you're a fan of this level or not, Map 23 is obviously still significant since it stars the barrels and uses their surrounding properties for an actual purpose. Oh god. The Chasm is another one of the most controversial Doom 2 levels, and I have very mixed thoughts on it. I honestly don't mind the small ledges, and the idea of tightrope walking in a first person shooter was unheard of until Sandy Peterson created the Chasm. But I don't believe that the level is all that fun nowadays. Map 24 is extremely ahead of its time, and I can appreciate the historical significance of it, as well as the awesome experimental style of Sandy Peterson's map design, but I usually try and skip past it on subsequent playthroughs. I didn't hate this map at first when replaying it for this video. My hatred for the chasm comes in when you get up to the exit room and if you fall off, there's no way to come back. There's teleporters set up in every other portion of the level, except on the way to the exit when there's fucking lost souls everywhere. That's complete nonsense, and I guess this would make sense if there were no teleporters in the map whatsoever, but there is. They just gave a middle finger to every single player right at the end. Apart from that, this level has demon encounters that might seem stale, with the red key room being a prime example of this. 
there's just Pinky Demon after Pinky Demon and it gets so tedious taking them out. In fact, the small ledges and the careful movement that the player is forced to do is one of my lesser issues with the map, because there isn't much of a downside for falling down as there's almost always a teleporter nearby. Nevertheless, the chasm puts a bad taste in my mouth, mostly due to the level exit not having a teleporter and the map being inconsistent. That all being said, I cannot criticise how creative Sandy Peterson was when coming up with these map layouts, and for that reason alone, he's one of the best Doom level designers to me. And it's funny I say that, because most of his Doom 2 levels aren't my cup of tea, and I'm not a huge fan of them. But his maps are still very influential. Bloodfalls is one of the more edgy Doom 2 map names, but the level itself is okay. I recently finished this map with a pistol start, and I've gotta say, it's much more fun compared to just playing sequentially like normal. Once you have the BFG, and if you're playing in order you should have it by now, but anyway, it makes Bloodfalls way too easy. The most difficult section is the beginning, and after that, map 25 becomes a cakewalk. Yeah, this map has pretty weird pacing. On the topic of the BFG, an interesting aspect about Bloodfalls is how the difficulty affects whether or not you can find one in the map. If a player accesses the second secret on the first three difficulty settings, the BFG will appear like usual, but that changes when you crank it up to Ultra Violence or Nightmare. The second secret still exists and you can tag it like normal, but the BFG won't be there at all, making it especially difficult for pistol starters. Anyway, aside from that bit of trivia about the map, the Blood Waterfalls are kinda cool to see, but every other design choice in this level feels bland. Map 25 is average at best, but as we're approaching the final few levels, average at best shouldn't be in this level's vocabulary. It seems that almost every Doom game has a strong start, but then it kinda dips in quality towards the end. Even going back to the original Doom, Episode 3 Mission 8, Dis, was very underwhelming, along with the penultimate level, Gate to Limbo. All I'm saying is that it's not exclusively a Doom 2 issue, but at least the next map picks up the quality. Now this map reminds me of Tenements with its cramped spaces and narrow walkways, and I really enjoy it. The Abandoned Mines is a little on the short side, but that's fine as the gameplay and map design shine through. I'm personally a fan of shorter levels anyway, so it's not really a big deal in my eyes. The part where the Baron pops up out of nowhere when you're trying to get the blue key still gets me to this very day, and it's a great gameplay bit. Dodging Cacodemon fireballs in these small contained hallways feels amazing, and taking out the chain gunners located in the top corners is fun too. Map 26 is a great time, and it's certainly an improvement from Bloodfalls. Monster Condo is certainly an interesting map, and it reminds me a ton of something like Black Tower from Doom 2's Master Levels. There are plenty of traps to spring, the area with the hanging bodies, the cluster of pain elementals, and the arch vial can be a pain in the arse, but it has a fair trade-off with the BFG secrets, and the teleport room featuring Mancubi and Revenants is great fun to play. Monster Condo is a weird gem of a map, and while it doesn't have the best texture work and some of the rooms might feel bland compared to other Doom 2 levels, the atmosphere and lighting really make it shine. Map 27 is dark, but it's not overly dark where you can't see anything. The high visibility goggles will help the player navigate around the level, but it's not a necessity like in Halls of the Damned for instance. This might be one of Sandy Peterson's best Doom 2 levels, and I've really come to appreciate this one more as time goes by. Map 28 feels extremely similar to Bloodfalls, and what I mean by this is that the map is extremely mediocre in my opinion. 
I love how the pain elementals are in prisons, almost as if id Software is admitting how annoying those enemies can be, and there's a few other decent set pieces here and there, but there's also nothing special or mind-blowing. While I'm a fan of the volcanic look of this open arena, the way that the beginning of the map looks is just bad, as the browns contrast weirdly with the blood reds and lava stone texture. Gameplay-wise, the spirit world is fine, but it kinda just blends in with other Doom 2 maps. Not terrible, but again, like Blood Falls, average at best shouldn't be in Map 28's vocabulary. Romero got a hold of Map 29, and holy fuck, he made an excellent penultimate stage. I like how in this level, the goal is not only composed of collecting keys and getting to the end, but instead it's more about climbing up this cliffside to fight the cyber demon at the top. Even though you can just run to the exit and avoid the cyber demon's rockets, I appreciate that there is at least some attempt at a boss at the end of the journey up the cliff. This level is challenging, and it feels like a combination of everything you have learnt so far playing the game. If this was the final map of Doom 2, it would not have disappointed. There's a good challenge factor as I've said, and there's also a very interesting design choice at play with the whole scaling up the mountain idea. As I said, this would be a perfect ending to Doom 2. But no, we have the icon of shit, I mean icon of sin, to deal with next. This map is very underwhelming, point blank. Even though I love the design of the Icon of Sin, how he looks like the Baphomets, and how it's essentially the ultimate representation of Satan in the Doom universe, the gameplay in this map sucks. You shoot three rockets into the Icon of Sin's exposed brain, and that's it. The final boss encounter is not really fun to fight, because you need to have a precise shot to the brain, and if you miss, you have to clear the board of enemies, wait for the lift to take you up, and try again. Map 30 is not that difficult, but when you beat the Icon of Sin, it's not rewarding at all. The boss doesn't feel like the ultimate test of your Doom abilities, it's just shooting rockets with some decent timing. This boss makes me appreciate Doom Eternal's last level way more. Even though Final Sin is not perfect, it at least attempts to throw everything at the player so it puts all of your acquired Doom Eternal skill into effect. With Doom 2's Icon of Sin, it feels like a throwaway concept. And that's it. Doom 2 is complete. And although it is my least favourite classic Doom I would, the game still introduced so many unique level design ideas to the table. We have so much more demon infighting, with the Cyber Demon vs Spider Mastermind battle being the culmination of that, we had larger map variety and a focus on more abstract design, there is double or even triple the amount of enemies on screen than in Doom 1, and even though I don't think many Doom 2 levels fully hold up, that doesn't mean they don't deserve to exist or anything. Doom 2's levels were so special back in 1995 and forged a path ahead for Doom mapping. There there are problems with Doom 2, but its legacy is still felt to this very day. However, there is only one new weapon with the Super Shotgun, which by itself is great and iconic, but when the trailer advertises that there will be new weapons, plural, yeah, that's not cool. The new weapons, although at this point we haven't settled in on exactly what those weapons will be, but there will be new weapons. At least the new enemies, while a couple of them are just colour swaps of previous Doom 1 demons, each one of them shakes up the gameplay enough to warrant their existence. Just to be clear, I don't hate Doom 2, in fact I am very glad it exists. In a vacuum, the new enemy variants and the super shotgun in Doom 2 are great and help flesh out the experience. For example, there are now a lot more mid-tier demons thanks to Doom 2, that modders and mapmakers can use for their custom wads. One of the issues I've heard regarding Doom 1 consists of the lack of demon variety and how that can make some levels rather repetitive. I personally disagree with that sentiment, but either way, Doom 2 fixes that by having more types of enemies, 
and that in turn has dramatically changed the Doom series as a whole. The fact that the new monsters and their various attack patterns and designs were mapped out in only 10 months is astonishing. It's actually incredible how they pulled it off. Praising Doom 2's innovations aside, I still have problems with quite a few of its levels and I've said it before and I'll say it again. Thank God for Doom Eternal fully realising the Hell on Earth concept. Anyway, next time I'll be covering the Plutonia Experiments and TNT Evolution, the two megawads that make up Final Doom. The map count for both games totals to 64 fucking levels and reviewing each and every level individually would take up too much of your time. Instead, I'm going to talk about Final Doom more generally, rather than dissect each stage. But for now, according to Doom 2's end screen at least, the invasion is over.